audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. You're listening to Momentum, a show that helps men succeed in life. And as we delve into this week's topic, a reminder that some of the content may be of a sensitive nature. Now, here's your hosts, Tim and Dez. Alrighty, well, welcome to this week's Momentum. It is Tim and Des with you once again, and we are so thankful that you've tuned in and are going to spend some time with us. You know, Momentum exists for you, just for you, uh, to help you do life a bit better and uh, bring some awareness and some, hopefully, some freedom into your life through what we're about to talk about. Our website, MomentumAustralia.org, is a great place to start to get to find out a bit more about who we are. And there's a whole bunch of resources on there too. Uh, that you can explore and hopefully benefit from. And again, if you'd like to financially support us, we are a ministry. We run things pretty lean here and any support is really, really welcomed. You can do that safely at MomentumAustralia.org. Let's bring my co-host and good friend Des into the picture in all of your splendid, bold glory. Wow. I don't know how to answer that, but thank you very much for inviting me. It's really cool. Guys, don't forget if you're doing life on your own and you need a safe and confidential conversation and you have no one in your world uh, that you can talk to, please reach out to 1-800-000-MEN. That's one 800 636 Guys, you know, some of us can't talk to our wives. Some of us don't have close mates and we strongly encourage men to have close mates around them that they can talk to and confide in uh, and be, be uh, accountable to. And also don't forget our YouTube channel. So we, we our older videos, our, our older interviews are now on YouTube, Momentum underscore four underscore men. And so that's really cool. Tim, how are you today? Uh, yeah, I'm really great, man. Can I just say, I'm, I'm not really a YouTube person, so it's probably easier for me to just go to the website and click the link. And if that's you too, just, just yes, head to right. the website, you'll find a link to YouTube there, <laughs> MomentumAustralia.org. Um, let's get into this week's show. You know, we, we all have a little voice inside of our heads, let's be honest. And sometimes that voice is really kind and loving and encouraging, and other times it's really harsh and critical. But yes, it's true. I mean, that little voice that's in our head can be hugely positive for us, but also can be a huge influence and can, to some extent, control our lives. And here to talk about that, we have our good friend, Richard Fay. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, guys. It's wonderful to be back with you again. Richard, let's talk about what we call the inner critic or what in sometimes most psychological terms gets called the inner critic. Let, let's unpack this because, I mean, let's be honest, we all we all have voices in our heads. <laughs> that sounds a little trippy, but we have that inner voice that speaks to us. And, you know, sometimes it, it's kind. For a lot of us, I think more often than not, it's actually harsh and critical. So let, let's look at what we call the inner critic. Where, when we use that term, is that what we're talking about? Is it that little voice inside of us? Well, I'm going to argue that there are probably a whole lot of internally constructed voices inside of us, and not just voices. Sometimes they just show up as emotions or or, uh, or energy in our body that then trigger a voice or a thought. Uh, the negative self-talk that we have, you idiot, what were you thinking? No one's going to respect you. You always do the same dumb thing over and over, that kind of internal self-talk it's very harsh it's very judgmental it's very critical and it seems to be all about ourselves and i am still amazed at the number of people who come to me for therapy who have very loud inner critics that Mm. are going almost all the time and of course the more they try to run from it the more that inner critic just chases them hounds them harasses them often when no one else is around. So, you know, we're talking about 11 o'clock at night or, or you know, 3 o'clock in the morning and they wake up and there's that inner critic. Well, mm. this isn't going to go well, is it? You've stuffed it up again, whatever it is. So where do you draw the line, uh, Richard, between what you've just described and, of course, the, you know, a biblical view that says, you know, the mind is deceitful, we are wicked, we are evil, sinful. How does that balance Well, I'm going to argue that if we live in an orphan state, you just understand when I say orphan state, we're living outside of what we were created to know. We were created to know uh, what the Apostle Paul calls adoption uh, or or what Jesus clearly calls this uh, understanding of having a heavenly father. Uh, And and I almost want to go beyond the word heavenly and just say father, real true father, because it's not that this father is only in heaven by the Holy Spirit, I believe, and I think you do too, this lives within us. Now, that voice is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and compassion. That voice is easy and gentle 
and I can find rest for my soul. And yet this inner critic, well, that's an evil voice because it's living in orphanhood. It's living with this belief that it's entirely up to me to get life sorted out and everything wrong I've ever done and ever felt judged for by often a parent early in life and then internalized as an internally psychological representation of the parent at their worst moments shows up in my life. I send an email and it's got something factually wrong and someone calls me out on it and I suddenly look like a fool in the workplace and I feel, what do I feel? I feel shame and the self-talk starts up. Now, shame, when you think about shame, just for a moment, shame, of course, is right there back in Genesis 3, hiding. And the problem, it, well, the, the advantage of shame is it gets you out of harm's way. So if you're in the workplace and you're feeling shame, oh, you idiot, look what you've done now, then you want to hide because you fear you're going to suffer pain. And so shame is actually designed to keep you out of harm's way. So shame is doing something quite clever and necessary if you're three years old. But my goodness, if you're 33 years old, it's a disaster. Because you're acting now, we all should have shame, all of us, because otherwise I would never know when I violate who I am as a beloved son of God. I, I Every time I violate my true identity, I will feel shame. I should. Otherwise, I'm a, a psychopath or a narcissist or something. So I want to feel shame. But when I make a small mistake, which I can fix and I feel shame, then you can almost guarantee it traces back to somewhere early in life where I was told that I was bad or believed that based on what my one of my parents usually, or a teacher possibly, or a grandparent, an authority figure, made me feel like what I was thinking or feeling was subhuman. It was bad, and therefore I am bad. And uh, so, yes, obviously I'm living in orphanhood because I'm living outside of this knowledge that I'm loved. Therefore... God says that's wicked, as in it's a lie, it's stupid, it's bad, because what am I doing? I'm harming one of God's creation. (laughs) Who am I harming? Myself. For God is love, and I'm truly not loving myself if I'm filled with an inner critic. Now, this is a psychological explanation of what we could often call the accuser of the brethren, you know, the enemy forces of darkness that are railed against us. And of course, any psychological reality has a spiritual component to it. So, I'm not arguing those things aren't true. I'm simply saying this is often how they show up in our life. As introjects is the word we use instead of uh, a project, I project something out, introject is something I send back in on myself against myself. I'm bad, I'm not good enough, I'm a failure, I'm stupid and so on. Wow. I mean, there's a lot in that and I love I love our conversations with you, Richard, because we it's like we just we throw a question at you and then we just get all of this deep well <laughs> we can draw on that. <laughs> I mean, and again encourage you to go back and, and re-listen to this already because there's so much in there but let, let's talk about the forming of the inner critic and you've mentioned there about it starts at a young age and generally if we feel orphaned and we've talked about this on the show with you before about this parental wounding so i suppose let's look at the link then between that and then how that does shape that inner voice and shame that you were just talking. Can you, I suppose, just explore that link for us a little bit more? Yes. So, we are designed to survive at the barest minimum. Otherwise, nothing else good happens. So, survival is a very strong instinct within humans. It, in fact, it's in all living creatures. Shove your finger towards an ant and watch it run away. Survive, it's got an exoskeleton. It doesn't feel pain like we do. It doesn't have emotions like we do. But it is intrinsically wired to survive. It's wired by its creator to survive. Mm. And so, we need to survive. The problem is, is that it's the lowest level of intelligence and therefore survival is a poor way of existing. However, when we're little and you have to remember we're little and the world is big and we don't have a lot of resources or a lot of tools to manage life and we've got a very angry authority figure in our life and maybe they're just not coping. They don't want to be angry. They'll probably feel guilt and shame and and maybe even have an inner critic after they lose it with us if they're a parent or a grandparent or whatever, as I said. Mm. But we'll internalize that voice. And if it happens frequently, as it usually does in families of origin, because you don't hear it once, you hear it mm, hundreds of times, hundreds of times. How many times have I told you? Is this as good as you can do? Well, you'll never amount to anything. 
I've had enough of you. Get out of my space. Don't you cry or give you something to cry about. I mean, I could keep <laughs> using them. If you haven't got it right, it's not good enough. Perfectionism will slip in, won't it? Yeah. Not just then, but over decades, the child grows into an adult, into a man, leaves home, gets married, has children, but the boy is still showing up with the internalization of that parent as an inner critic. And it's trying to keep, if you think about it, if you think of a, an inner critic as uh, an, a soldier trying to help you in a war that's long over, you know, it's, it's like uh, there's a story, and it's actually a true story, of, of Japanese soldiers marooned on uh, Pacific atolls after the end of World War II, and they uh, wore their tattered uniforms for decades. There was one who lived for 22 years after the end of the war. 1967, container ship goes past, sees the smoke, goes on a search party, finds this poor Japanese soldier who thinks the war's still happening. And, of oh course, in the honor-shame culture of Japan in World War II, you had two choices, which was fight for the emperor or die in honor, but do not survive and be a captive. So, uh, to survive was dishonorable. And so, he he discovers that we're allies with America now. They're our friends. We have, They're our trading partners. There is no war. He goes back to Japan. Everyone's got on with their life, and he can't work out why he's been willing to fight this this war for 22 years long after it finished. And he had to be have medals pinned on him, sent home to his family and said, you can rest now. We need to do these to these, in, these loyal soldiers within us. And an inner critic is a loyal soldier trying to fight for us from decades ago, trying to keep us safe in a war that's long over. Wow. Wow. That's huge. <laughs> I have never heard it put like that. No. If it's trying to keep us alive richard why is it so harsh and critical for a lot of people what why is it not more loving because know? it's never been loved now that sounds the strangest thing i'm gonna say well i'm uh, supposed to love this angry part and the voice inside me well if you ignore a child i'll ask either one of you um timothy or des if i if you ignore one of your children and they're little mm. what are they going to do Hook up. they're going to throw a tantrum yeah they're going to make more noise. So if we constantly see what this, this inner critic does is it blends with us and shows up as us and convinces us that we are the inner critic. I'm a piece of work, aren't I? In other words, I end up with a pretty low perspective of myself because that's what the inner critic says about me. But I never stop and listen to this poor, exhausted inner critic that's overwhelmed with its job of trying to keep me safe all these years on a few pieces of, of information, most of them which are, are false now or entirely false. You know, I, uh, someone would say to me, oh, Richard, I need to have a word with you and I'd have a knife sharp pain in my gut go, uh-oh, oh, yeah. what have I done? Wow. The inner critic. Now someone says, I want to have a word with you and I go, oh, that's exciting. I wonder what it is. <laughs> but I can tell you that's, that's a slow journey. Just before we came online, we're talking about how when you're in the midst of something painful, it feels like it goes forever. But when you look back on it, you realize it was actually only a short period once you start doing the work. Wow. We are going to take a short break on Momentum. We're talking with Richard Fry about our inner critic. And uh, man, this is a meaty conversation and encourage you to go back and listen to this uh, once we got through the second part, which is coming up real soon. It is Momentum. We'll take a short break. Encourage you to have a look around our website as we do that, MomentumAustralia.org. And we'll be back with Richard Fry to talk more on our inner critic in just a moment. This is Momentum, a show that helps men succeed in life. Find out more at MomentumAustralia.org. If this program has highlighted something you'd like prayer for, we'd love to pray for you. Call 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's 1-800-772-936. It's a free call. Or text 0401 132 888. You're listening to Momentum, a show that helps men succeed in life. Find out more at MomentumAustralia.org. You're back with Momentum, and this week we have Richard Fay with us, and we're talking about an inner critic. And, you know, some of the things that Richard was talking about before the break, I can so relate to. And and it's interesting, the sort of phrases we use and the, the things that we think about in terms of how we analyze our inner circle and how that interacts with us is really crazy. So, I mean, we've talked about the journey that you went on when you went and saw a therapist, and, and you 
you change that inner critic into more of a challenger. So I, I think let's we've identified what it is and we all agree that we all have it, right? Uh, and everybody listening can go, right, I've had some light glow moments. I'm not the only one. Thank the Lord. <laughs> that, there's a, that we all kind of feel like this to some degree. How, how did we then start, not necessarily silencing, but certainly, because for a lot of us, right, let's be honest, sometimes the inner critic is very loud. It's It's what we hear predominantly, and it is exhausting. So how do we at least start to overcome or tame the inner critic? Is it by simply loving those parts? Is it by what you did, uh, shifting it from a critic to a challenger? Like, what are some keys that people can take away from today to go, I want to silence that voice in my head or at least start taming it? The very, very first step is always awareness. So, because the part blends with us and convinces us that we are that part when it's in, in motion, then the role to uh, be able to work with that part is to unblend from it or to unhook from its energy, which requires us to step away and observe it, notice it, become aware of it when it's showing up. Now, that's really difficult if for your whole life it's showing up as you and you've operated almost like a zombie on autopilot. As soon as it takes over, It runs the show for however long it chooses to, and you just feel beat up at the end of it. Now, it's very hard then to be able to go, oh, here it goes. It's happening again. It's happening in my body. It's happening in my mind. It's happening in my emotions. Oh, but it's not me. It's something that's I constructed from some pretty crude raw materials of many, many years ago when I was small and uh, it's tried to keep me safe from then, but it's not working for me anymore. I wonder... What are you trying to do for me, part this part? What is this inner critic trying to do for me right now? Oh, oh, you don't want me to get in trouble. Thank you. Mm. Why would I get in trouble? Who is going to, I, I, I made a mistake. Who's going to shout at me? Where, where, where is that coming from? You can normally trace it right back to when you were shouted at for making a mistake. You can probably, usually in the moment, and this is the beauty, is the raw material of the energy of that inner critic will trace you back to when you felt it, the earliest time you can remember feeling it. Now, obviously, the easiest way to do this work is with a therapist, a counselor, someone who's going to listen to you, who's got the skills to take you through this process because it's complicated. And because the part blends with us so instantaneously, it takes years for us, usually on our own, to be able to do that work of unblending, noticing, observing, and engaging from a distance where you stay in control of that part. That part doesn't then take over. Uh, because it, I'll give you an example. I, I try to start this work and then I go, I get all confused. And then I feel, oh, you idiot. You can't even, you can't even listen to an inner critic. And what's the inner critic doing is beating you up for not helping it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny how this inner critic will show up in any way, shape or form. And of course, then we, we're blended again. Whereas if you could even in that moment go, it's okay, I haven't sorted this out, I need to start in this work. It's all right, inner critic. Yeah, you're constantly wanting the load taken off you and I haven't done it. We'll get there. Now, the problem is, is to be able to say, we'll get there, I'm tapping into something else, which is who we are in Christ, our true self. Our true self is what is the one thing that tethers us in the midst of helping a, to work with an inner critic. We have to reflect on, now I know for a young man, I memorized a whole lot of passages of scripture, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalm 139. Why I needed to know that? Because I didn't think it was true. Yeah. I thought I was a reject. You know, the reject shop is where Richard Fay got sold because, you know, <laughs> you, you, you go to the boutique stores to get other men, but me, I, I was a, wow. a made up from, from broken parts. The truth is, is that I don't belong in a reject shop. And so, I memorized scriptures like that. That's one way. Uh, obviously, l- talking, listening to, to other men, but developing an awareness of a kindness and tenderness. In other words, God in in heaven can project all of this love and truth and comfort and reassurance all the way from heaven and then stop because we disagree with God and go, no, actually, You might say all these things about me, but they're not true. I'm actually a piece of work. I'm a piece of garbage. And, of course, 
God won't usurp our free will. So it stops there. Wow, that's a good way of putting it, actually. I love that. It can get no closer because we won't let the truth get any closer to us. We have to let the truth into our hearts and we have to appropriate that truth. And that gets appropriated by a kind, gentle inner relationship with our ourself and all the parts, all the energies within us. Can I jump in on that for a second, Richard? Because what I wanted actually to go back to, and I think this is perhaps a great time, you mentioned in the first part of the show about the fact that we can struggle to love all of ourselves because particularly as Christian men, well, that means I've got to love the bits that I don't like about myself that keep sinning, for example, right? The, the things that I do. So how do we do that? And I think to some degree that shame and that sin will keep us pushing God's love away because I don't feel like I'm worthy of it because I still do this stuff and I'm a Christian. I'll give you an example. And this is a really good example because it comes up all the time. A man lies to his wife about all kinds of things. He lies about having uh, lunch with a female colleague because he's afraid that his wife is going to get angry with him because he's gone and had lunch in a cafe with a woman who's not her. Because Mm -hmm. you see, he cheated on her 10 years ago and she still doesn't trust him. And she doesn't still doesn't trust him because he's still avoiding her anger because he's afraid of her anger. And that's why he keeps lying and hiding. It's not so much that he lies, but he hides it. And she looks at his diary one weekend and sees, oh, on Thursday, you had lunch with Sally and you didn't tell me about it. What else, what else aren't you telling me? And immediately he feels shame. He feels humiliation. The inner critic takes over and he feels, oh, no, I'm such a terrible person. And then he defends himself and gets angry. It was a colleague. I shouldn't have to tell you everything. And, of course, then she feels even more distant, more alone in the marriage and has more reason to doubt and suspect him even when he's not doing anything. Can you see what I'm get, what's going on here? I'm using this as a really, a really life example of a lot of men's stories. Lying or hiding or deceiving or not disclosing, just not being transparent with a partner, with a wife, is an example of an inner critic showing up. What's the inner critic saying? Man, if she really knew all your temptations, gosh, she wouldn't want to stay with you. And then, of course, that man, or um, if you are honest and vulnerable, You'll be, you are weak and you'll be trampled all over and then you'll be abandoned and you'll be alone. And, of course, that's a recipe for a miserable marriage for both of them, mm. not, just the, not just the man, the woman as well. She's completely alone in that marriage. Now, if he loved that part that lied, I'm not saying that he indulges it, but he starts to understand it. In other words, have a parental relationship with it, not a peer relationship. Oh, come on, lying part. What else can we lie about? That's absurd. It's a parental relationship with that lying part. Oh, you are trying still to keep me out of trouble because you think my wife is my mother. You Mm. know what? She's not. Mm. I'm a man. Uh, How many men say, oh, my wife's got me by the short and curlies? You know, it's like language like that. Mm. Um, you know, it's it, it this language that implies that 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 women are mothers, wives are mothers. So you can see where it's it's got an authority to it. It's not an indulge indulging this this energy that's unhelpful. Well, that's actually sin, to put it simply. Deceiving is the root and essence of all sin. But of course, what's it based in? Fear, and fear is based in a lie. And that lie is that we are weak and pathetic, and that we're going to be abandoned and all these things I just said. Mm. So going back to the roots of this thing and then parenting it, saying it's okay, we can tell the truth because then you can, that man could go to his wife and go, I'm going to become far more transparent with you, but I'm also going to engage with your fear. I'm going to engage with your fear that I am hiding something from you. I'm not going to disagree with your fear. I'm not saying it's true. I'm just going to say, I can hear you now because now I can move towards you because I'm not weak and pathetic and you aren't going to run over me so I can engage and listen. I don't have to defend anything now because if I'm weak and pathetic, I have to defend everything. But if I'm whole or if I can, if I'm loved, if I'm worthy of love, then I can move towards my, my partner. I think that is profound. I think it's profound in terms of relationships, marriages, any sort of relationship. I think what you've just described is absolutely amazing and truthful. I think all men would at some point in time fall into that trap. Yes. Mm, It's amazing. Absolutely, yeah. 
It's been a huge show. Exposing our inner critic uh, is what we've been talking about this uh, week with Richard Fay. Richard Fay's website, by the way, is richardfay.com.au. And uh, the Momentum website, momentumaustralia.org, encourage you to have a look around there and uh, re-listen to this show with a notepad and pen and um, sit with it. Let, let this stuff sink in for a little while. This is really deep stuff that we're to be talking about today, and this is not going to be a 24-hour overnight fix, but it might just start a journey for you to silence that inner critic that we've been talking about. Richard Fay, always a very deep, stimulating, massive, huge topic and conversation. Thank you for your time today. And, uh, mate, you take care until we get you on the show again. Thank you very much, guys. You've been listening to Momentum, a show that helps men succeed in life. For more information or to hear this week's show again, go to MomentumAustralia.org. You can also access a whole range of resources to help you on your journey and to get in touch with the team at MomentumAustralia.org. Until next time, keep moving forward with Momentum.